And now in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray again. Most holy God, the earth is filled with your glory, and before you angels and saints stand in awe. Enlarge our vision to see your power at work in the world, and by your grace make us heralds of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated as we turn to today's appointed readings. First reading comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Last week we heard the call story of Jeremiah. This week we hear the call story of a different prophet, the prophet Isaiah. It's sort of ironic that uh, the prophet isn't officially called till the sixth chapter of the book. I don't know exactly why that is, but it occurred to me last evening. But in this uh, Uh, reading we hear Isaiah respond to the call of God somewhat more confidently than Jeremiah last week, but still with some trepidation with the words, Here I am, Lord, which of course are responsible for him, many of us like. Our first reading is from the sixth chapter of Isaiah, verses 1 through 13. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting in a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Keep listening, but do not comprehend. Keep looking, but do not understand. Make the mind of this people dull, and stop their ears and shut their eyes, so that they may not look with their eyes, and listen with their ears, and comprehend with their minds, and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant, houses without people, and the land is utterly desolate, until the Lord sends everyone far away, and vast is the emptiness in the midst of the land. Even if a tenth part remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth, or an oak whose stump remains standing, then it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. We now respond to that call story of Isaiah with the words of Psalm 138, reading them with one another in responsive fashion. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. When I called, you answered me, you increased my strength within me. They will sing of the ways of the Lord, that great is the glory of the Lord. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. O 
Our second reading comes from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, as it has throughout this entire season of Epiphany. Early in the letter, uh, St. Paul tells the Corinthians he's known nothing but Christ crucified among them. Uh, But now he also lets it be known in this particular passage that without Easter, the church is a bust, that Easter is the heart and soul of the church, and that we are resurrection people, and that if we ever cease to be such, ever cease to believe in our own resurrection, in the resurrection of the world, to life perfection, uh, we've ceased to be Christian. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 11. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than five hundred brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. If you're now able and so desire, I'd invite you to rise for the gospel. Alleluia. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fish for people. Alleluia. A gospel reading as it often will. This church here comes to us from the gospel of Luke. Last couple of weeks we've heard from Luke chapter 4 where Jesus preaches in his hometown, sort of sets out his mission statement, says he's, then, says he's been sent to set us free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And now, a chapter later, we sort of see what this will mean, Jesus setting us free, what it will uh, manifest itself like in our lives in the call of Peter and James and John and others. The Gospel according to Luke, glory to you, O Lord. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of those boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your nets down for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken, And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. I'd invite you to be seated.
One of the interesting things about that narrative, I'm not going to focus on it this morning, but I'll just share it with you, is that in antiquity, and maybe also today, people use different nets for night fishing and for day fishing. The nets used at night shouldn't work during the day, which is why Peter is reluctant in this story. He's not outfitted, he's not equipped all fish during the day. He's got night nets, and yet these night nets work like no tomorrow in our reading, adding further display to how Jesus is a pretty special guy. Not only do we catch all these fish, we catch them with equipment which shouldn't work at the time it works. But what I want to zero in on more than that this morning is a pattern that emerges across our readings this morning. Usually there are patterns linking our readings, and I like to draw attention to them. And here's the pattern, at least one of the patterns present this morning. In all of our non-responsive readings, God forgoes direct action for indirect action through people like you and me. Rather than the extraordinary showing up in extraordinary ways that stand out from the crowd, God instead chooses to take the long way around, not acting directly, not showing up in the extraordinary, but showing up in average, ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill people like you and me. First place we get this today is in our reading from Isaiah. God, presumably, could have flicked on some sort of repentance-generating switch in heaven and brought Israel back to faith. God maybe could have yelled out of the heavens by God's self and said, Hey, shape up! But is this what God does? Nope. For going direct action, God acts indirectly, takes the long way around, sending Isaiah to try to get Israel to come to its senses and repent. This is the first time of many times this is going to happen in our appointed readings. God forgoes direct action, instead acting through average, ordinary, everyday, run-of-the-mill people and things. Why? Why does God take the long way around? To use an analogy, why does God show up in the fan in the stands rather than the star athlete celebrating a touchdown in the end zone? Why, why, why? Well, if we stick with our reading from Isaiah first, one of the reasons may be that the holy and the unholy aren't too safe to bring together. It may be that the holy and the unholy are like water and oil in that they don't mix. This is certainly the fear of Isaiah in our first reading. He shows up in the presence of a holy God with no buffer, no protection. There he stands, a man of unclean lips from an unclean people in the presence of a holy God, and he is petrified. He thinks he's on the way out. He fears that he's about to go snap, crackle, pop, with God's holiness being the milk and his unholiness being the Rice Krispies. And indeed, Isaiah must be purified, must be purified before community with God is safe in our reading. This is a very common way to talk about the holy and the unholy in Scripture. They don't mix without a buffer. They don't mix without some sort of of protective measures in place. It's all over the place. And so often, too often, to preach on in every instance this morning, 
rather than acting directly, rather than bringing God's holiness into direct contact with our unholiness, God instead acts to choose on the other side of a buffer, on the other side of a go-between. This is all over the Bible. Our unholiness and God's holiness don't mix. You put them together without a safety net, and what you're going to get is snap, crackle, pop. It certainly tells us that God is no play toy, that God is no plaything, that God is no puppy. Certainly explains to us why the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Don't approach God as if God is a puppy, a play toy, or a plaything. God is the holy judge of all creation. And if you bring your unholiness into contact with this holy judge of all creation, his white hot, uncompromising, unrelenting holiness may lead you to go snap, crackle, pop. One of the reasons God acts indirectly is for our protection, is for our safety. But there are other additional alternative ways to think about why God so consistently takes the long way around for going direct action for indirect action involving us rather than taking care of it himself using the ordinary, the common, the everyday, even what we might call the mundane. Turn now to our reading from 1 Corinthians. Here we've got the same pattern again. Rather than acting directly, God acts indirectly. Rather than taking the shortest route from point A to point A, B, God takes the long way around. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God had what it took to let the world know that it happened, just like that. You know, we have billboards, you know, that illumine a, a small area. I can envision God emblazoning the skies with a message the whole world could see, saying, He is risen. Alleluia. You think Twitter and Facebook and satellite radio and cable news can communicate quickly the world over? God could have done that long ago and quicker than any method of technology available to us today. But it didn't happen. God did not emblazon the skies with a billboard announcing, Alleluia, He is risen. Instead, He chose to take the long way around acting indirectly rather than directly, involving average, ordinary people like Paul and all the other Easter witnesses we hear about in our reading from 1 Corinthians. And of course, this is all prefigured in our reading from Luke, when God says to Petey boy, don't ever think I'm a one-man operation. I need you. I'm not going to take care of this all myself. I need you and many others. Why? Why does God take the long way around? Why does God act indirectly rather than directly? Why does the grandest of all beings act through the average, the ordinary, the common, the mundane? And speaking of this, why are we baptized was simple every or, everyday ordinary water rather than something a little more flashy. Surely God could have dreamed up an element for such an important sacrament flashier than water. Why old, plain, ordinary water? And speaking of sacrament, when we come to the table, why is it Mogan David, maybe Manischewitz, and a wafer rather than steak and lobster rather than champagne and caviar? Why does God so often forgo the flashy for everyday stuff, for everyday people? Well, I've already put one thing out there before you today, that God uh, acts on the other side of a buffer to keep us safe. But let's be cynical for a moment. Will you allow me to be cynical? All right, let's be cynical. 
maybe, maybe our sacred scriptures, our sacred rites, our sacred traditions so often use the common and the ordinary because they want to scam us into thinking that we matter, that the church matters, that the sacraments matter, that the priesthood matters, that people of faith matter. If all this stuff matters, the church is never going to be short on money and people, right? Maybe it's all a scam. This has been said before, you know. Karl Marx, what did he say about religion? He said, religion is the opiate of the masses. What did communism do for decades? Said to the people, stay out of these churches. This religion stuff, it's all fake. It doesn't matter. It's not true. And what do many young people say today about religion? If you don't know, here's what they say. They say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. All that church stuff is a bunch of bunk. Now, as I put that out there this morning, let me stay, say right off the top that I think it's pretty far-fetched to say that this emphasis we get this morning upon God acting through the ordinary is some sort of scam. Let me put one reason out there right away. This pattern I'm talking about, God using the average, the ordinary, the common, it shows up in both our Old Testament readings and our New Testament readings. Do you know how many years separate those writings? At least 600. Do you know that uh, Old Testament's written in Hebrew, New Testament's written in Greek? Do you know that the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament call God by different names? How probable is it that people that never met one another and that didn't even speak the same language arrived at the same scam? Not too probable, I would say, but I think we've got to be honest, the church hasn't always been above board. The church has sometimes been a den of thieves. Let me just lift up one example for you. One could very easily argue that there'd be no Lutheran church today if the church had not gone about selling get-out-of-purgatory-free cards known as indulgences. 500 years ago, a fellow named Johann Tetzel and his crew, expert marketers, ran around all of Europe saying, and boy, this was a good marketing line before there was modern marketing. These folks ran around, and I said, Carter, Steve... When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Isn't that a pretty good scam? Isn't that a pretty good marketing message? When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul, the soul of your dead loved one from purgatory springs. You think a lot of coins went in the coffer? They did. You know what all those coins were used to do? Build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. That's the money responsible for that church. Scam money. And it was a scam through and through. Does purgatory, a kind of waiting room for heaven, actually exist? No. There's no mention of it in Scripture whatsoever. And do you need an indulgence uh, to be saved? I hope you all know this. You only need two things to be saved. Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit's gift of faith. And yet, the church was running around seeing, saying you needed more than that. You didn't just need Jesus. You didn't just need the Holy Spirit's gift of faith. You needed an indulgence. Has the church sometimes been scammy? And slimy, we can admit it. It's sometimes been scimy, scammy, scammy, and slimy. But indulgences are one thing. I think it's a little harder to argue 
that the emphasis we get today upon God acting through the ordinary, the common, is some sort of scam. The oldest writings in the New Testament are all written by the same fellow. Do you know the fellow's name? He's one of the giants of Christianity. His name is St. Paul. We believe the oldest letter in the New Testament is letter to the Galatians. And, do you know what he's talking about in his letter to the Galatians? The water of baptism. He says that water is a means of grace that clothes us with Christ forever. And you know how many years after the resurrection that little letter was written? Maybe 15, 20? How about communion? Multiple times in his letter to the first Corinthians, multiple times before we get to today's selection from that letter, St. Paul calls the Mogan David and the average ordinary bread means of grace, bearers of Christ's body and blood. You know how long after the resurrection he was writing that stuff? 20 years, maybe? If a fix was on, if a scam was on, it was on very early, long before the church had made a name for itself, long before there were big buildings, long before there were priesthoods, long before there were convents, long before there were monasteries, long before there were big estates to maintain. That doesn't seem very probable to me. And our reading from 1 Corinthians itself is an argument against the church and its teachings being a scam. Did you notice how many original witnesses to the resurrection St. Paul lists off in this reading? Is it just one person? Is it just Peter's word? Or is it just Paul's word? Or is it just Klimke's word? It's not. He lifts up over 500 original witnesses to the resurrection. This is one of the strengths of our faith, if you want to know what I think. Our faith is not based upon the testimony of one person. For us, there's not a, uh, a Muhammad or a Confucius or a Buddha or a Joseph Smith. There's a whole community of original Easter witnesses we call the apostles. It means something to say we're an apostolic church. And guess what? The writings of all these witnesses, they clearly communicate that these folks didn't always get along. They didn't like each other some of the time. But they still all taught the same gospel. Sound like a scam to you? Doesn't to me. The church has been slimy sometimes, but it's pretty clear to me that this teaching that God moves through the ordinary, the average, the everyday, is at the core of what the church has always been about. Amen? So let's bring this home. If it's not a scam, if it's more than a measure to keep us safe from the white-hot burning holiness of a holy God, what is it? Why does God so routinely forgo direct action for indirect action? Why does God so routinely take the long way around? Rather than acting directly, extraordinarily, why does God so often act through the ordinary, the average, the everyday? Well, it's here where I are, it's here where our identity as liturgical Christians may help us out. The stuff we do every week in worship, it's supposed to teach us about a life of faith. And do you know what the word liturgy means? It's a biblical word, shows up in the Bible, and it basically means work of the team. The basic idea is that God does God's part, priest does his or her part, the people do their part. The idea is that with God doing God's part, the priest doing the priest's part, the people doing their part, we're going to be drawn into closer and more harmonious and more united relationship with one another. And I think this goal, relationship, 
explains why God chooses to take the long way around. God is committed to relationship with us. God wants to do things together, not apart. Until we reach the end of time, it's going to be in us and through us or not at all for God. God is committed to relationship with us. And if you've ever been in a relationship, let me ask you, do relationships sometimes take, require taking the long way? Do they require detours? Do they require indirect paths sometimes? They do. Yesterday we had a funeral luncheon here at church. There were a number of young children there, mostly boys, and so after they ate their meal, they started to play basketball, and we had a delightful young four-year-old, a member of our congregation present named Harrison, and he was trying to play basketball with the big boys. And boy, he was frustrated at least four or five times. He ran over to his mommy and his daddy, and he said, they won't share. Well, ask them to share, mom and dad said. So little Harrison ran over to the big boys, and he said, give me the ball. Didn't work. So he ran back to his parents again and said, they won't share, mommy and daddy. Well, you asked wrong. You didn't say please. So he ran back over again, and he said, my mommy and my daddy said, you're supposed to give me the ball. Did that work? No. So he runs back over again, and you get the basic idea. This is what relationships require. They require the long way round, often. And being so committed to a relationship with us, God is willing to stay the course, taking the long way around, working with us and in us in spite of all of our warts, wrinkles, and other crazy stuff. The time may come when time will run out on us. Sooner or later, you've got to have a relationship with God or it's going to be too late. But, not, but too late isn't going to come before at least some of us reach the finish line with God. Not behind God, but with God. And so each week, may Scripture, sacrament, liturgy, and Holy Spirit remind us that God desires real and genuine relationship with us, that God's always got work for us to do and places for us to be, and the work is always... Starts with an L, ends with an E. The work is always love, Christ-like love. And the places are always the places where there's someone who needs one of God's go-betweens. Someone who will come and say, God loves you, and so do I. Amen? Good. Before we carry on in our service, I'd invite you to be seated, uh, and I would invite my, my friends Claire and Reagan uh, forward to share with you all a bit about what we learned down the hall this morning. And bring your fishing poles. All right. So we were talking down the hall uh, about the, the Bible story uh, from the gospel and, you know, I told you guys that, that Jesus' first friends, first disciples were, were fishermen. And we, we talked about, you know, a good fisherman knows what kind of bait to use to catch different kinds of fish or, or to catch anything, really. So what, what did we say that a fisherman would use to catch fish? Worms. Yep. And... and you, you both are, are with me. You said you don't really like worms. I, I don't like worms either. Um, but then we talked about you know, what, what a fisherman might use, what they might put on the end of their pole if they were catching other things. You know, so if you were catching a puppy, Claire, what did you tell me you'd use to catch a puppy? 
a bone. Yep. Um, or a kitty, you might put uh, a little toy mouse at, at the end. Uh, we talked about Winnie the Pooh. Um, you know, Winnie the Pooh loves honey. Winnie the Pooh loves honey. Um, and, you know, if we were trying to catch Winnie the Pooh, we might put some honey at the end of our, our fishing pole. Um, we talked about your, your mom and dad, too, didn't we? What, what did you tell me you, you might put at the end of a fishing pole to catch your dad? Sushi. Yep. Um, and and you, you weren't sure about mommy, but, but you, you, you still think chocolate would be the, the thing to catch mommy at the end of a fishing pole? Yeah. Well, the other thing we talked about, though, is, is that even though you, you might have special things to put at the end of your pole to catch different kinds of people, the, the one way... That, that you catch everyone, any type of person whatsoever, is what we, we put at the end of the, the fishing poles we, we made. So can you guys hold up your fishing poles and show them off to the grown-ups? So what, what's at the, the end uh, of your fishing pole? Say it really, really loud for me. A heart. So the best way to catch people, any kind of person, is to show them love. And, and, you know, the thing about fishing, and Pastor Scott talked about this a little bit, you know, fishing is kind of a trick. You know, when you're trying to catch a fish, you dangle that, that worm in front of them, and, and then once they, they nibble at it, you pull it away, and you try and, you try and get them to follow. So, you know, you wouldn't really catch a person with love by a fishing pole. You, you wouldn't want to pull away your love. You'd want to give it to them. So the, the ways that, that we might catch people with our love is by showing them love, by, by doing good things, you know, helping people know that, that we love them, being nice to them, being kind to them. You know, all of those are, are ways that, that we might catch someone with love. And, and you know, once we, we've shown someone how much we, we love them, do you, do you think we're going to hold on to them? Reagan says, yeah. Yeah, we, we hold on to the people that, that we love. You know, and, and that's one of the most important pe- things about being a, a fisher for people. We, we don't just bring them in and then throw them back into the pond. We, we don't just you know, try and trick them to follow our our heart and and get them a little bit closer. We bring them in, and those people that we love, we hold on to them as tight as we can because the people that we love are so important to us. And it's not just mom and dad. It's not just our our friends. We we should really hold on to and and love everyone that that we can. So that's our, our job for, for this week. We're, we're going to be fishermen for people. We're going to show them our love. We're going to bring them in and we're going we're gonna to hold on to them as hard and tight as we can. So let's bow our heads down and fold our hands and say a prayer together. So dear God, uh, thank you for helping us to share our love and, and use our love to, to bring other people close to us. And we ask that you just help us to always hold on to the people that we love the most, our, our moms and dads and sisters and brothers and, and puppies and kitties and, and everyone else that, that means so much to us in our lives. We ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, girls, for coming up and showing off your, your fishing poles. You can head back to, to mom. And I would invite the the congregation to rise as we continue sharing our love uh, through the prayers of intercession. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance, so we are bold to pray for the church, the world, and all that are in, in all that God has made. Equip your church to proclaim the good news that we have first received. 
the forgiveness and grace shown to us through Jesus Christ. Send us out as apostles, sharing the hope of your salvation with a waiting world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Holy are you, O God of hosts. Heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Reveal your splendor in fiery sunsets and in deep blue twilights. Keep us to keep, teach us to recognize you in the beauty of our natural world. God of grace, hear our prayer. Soften the hearts of rulers and governments that they perceive and tend to the needs of their people. Remove corruption and the impulse toward violence. Protect first responders and military personnel who risk their lives in service of others. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your steadfast love endures forever. Do not abandon those who look to you for hope and healing. Bless doctors, nurses, social workers, therapists, and all who are caregivers. Draw near to those who are scared, sick, or in pain, especially those on our parish prayer list and those we name aloud and in our hearts before you now. God of grace, hear our prayer. The disciples received help from partners as they brought in an abundant catch of fish. So strengthen this congregation's partnerships with community organizations and ministries throughout Richland and Johnstown and beyond. Multiply our shared efforts and bring joy to our relationships. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our ancestors in faith who boldly answered your call. By their example, give us courage to live in faith and to proclaim your mercy until the day that you gather us into your glory. God of grace, hear our prayer. Since we have such great hope in your promises, O oh God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us take a moment to share a sign of that peace with one another. Few announcements for you then. I knew this uh, last week, but I wasn't certain I could share it publicly, so I've now confirmed that I can. Uh, a member of our congregation named Al Johnson, uh, that would be the father of Debbie Wechtenheiser, father-in-law of Brian Wechtenheiser, worked at uh, Bethlehem Steel for a long, long time, been a Johnstown guy all his life. He's having some health problems, oh, and uh, Brian and Debbie are needing to care for him uh, pretty much uh, hour, you know, every hour of the day. Uh, there are some signs of improvement, but uh, be praying for Al, be praying for Debbie, be praying for Brian. Uh, somewhat humorously, I came into work uh, this week and there was a post-it note on my door saying, Alonzo Johnson is in the hospital. I said, I don't know any Alonzo Johnson, so I didn't think anything of it. And then uh, I thought to myself, I wonder if Al Johnson is Alonzo Johnson. I thought it was Albert Johnson, but uh, I called uh, and indeed it was Albert, not Alonzo. So uh, I don't know who Alonzo Johnson is. If you can uh, shed any light on it, uh, that'd, be, that'd be helpful. Uh, we uh, did have a funeral yesterday, as I mentioned. It was for uh, Florence Barker, more commonly called Flo Barker. Uh, you know, uh, when we were preparing for the sermon, uh, for the service rather, I was writing down dates of life, and this happened. Uh, hasn't happened to me before. I wrote down, let's say, 1522 to 2122. Florence was born in 1922, uh, died in 2022. Oh, so we actually had to spell that out uh, yesterday, uh, indicating, you know, 1922, your birth, your birth, your death, 2022. She was very close to her 100th birthday, but uh, she had been uh, uh, overcome by senility and uh, needed to be put in our beauty manner here recently. Real, real hard for her, real, real hard for her husband. Uh, so if Jesus wasn't going to come again first, it was probably best uh, that she join him now. And I know that's how the family's feeling and everybody else, but uh, neat lady. Uh, got word yesterday that someone that's near and dear to many of our hearts, uh, Dr. Dalton Blau, 
uh, had a fall uh, this week at uh, Laurel View, a little banged up, uh, beholding him uh, in prayer. Uh, and uh, had a busy day yesterday. Uh, started out at the men's breakfast over at uh, Bethany United Methodist Church. They have a group of men who gets together there every Saturday at 8 o'clock. Uh, they've been doing it for over 40 years. I thought yesterday when I was driving through the snow there, well, I wonder how many people will be there. Well, it was a pretty hearty group of men there, all ready to have breakfast and to receive the word. Then we had uh, the funeral, and uh, then we had the service last evening and our annual meeting. Uh, the annual meeting went just as an annual meeting should go. Oh, uh, people worked hard ahead of time. They prepared a good packet, uh, and uh, the leader of the meeting and our whole council set the right tone for the meeting. And so what we did what we needed to do uh, in, I think, about 10 or 15 minutes. That's how it's supposed to go. And I have to tell you, I'm very, very, very proud of this congregation this morning. Very, very proud. You told me when we started six years ago that you wanted to get towards that sort of atmosphere. Avoid the rabbit holes, avoid the sinkholes, avoid the sideways energy. And together, we're doing that. I'm very, very proud of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In terms of uh, meetings this week, our all-parish team will meet Tuesday night at 6.30. You're invited to come out for that group. They talk about the things we do together, a.k.a. mostly worship right now, but when we get out of COVID, fellowship times as well. And I think the big three things they'll be talking about this time are what mix of music do we use here at Mount Calvary? During the pandemic, because we couldn't sing, we started to use a lot larger variety of music, and guess what? Many people in the congregation really, really liked that wider variety of music, liked a little contemporary music, liked a little secular music that uh, fit with the themes. And then you have others who uh, like uh, traditionally church music. What do you do with all that? Oh, how do you bring it together in a mix and a fashion uh, that is edifying for everybody? Not easy to solve. Also, they're going to be talking about that a little bit. And by the way, our denomination has a new hymnal out. So uh, one of these days, we're going to have to get together and try that baby out. So that'll be part of the discussion. Then we're uh, continuing to try to get back to our pre-COVID level of operation where worship wasn't the Klimke and Gress show, Klimke, Adams, and Gress show. It wasn't a spectator sport. Uh, We were all uh, participating in it. And then we're continuing to look for musicians like Joan Hunter here and others who can uh, supplement uh, Dan's uh, very good efforts. Uh, I uh, came to the funeral yesterday worrying that our, our lot might not be shoveled. Uh, thankfully, the lot was shoveled. Had to do a little work on the sidewalks, but I knew that I wouldn't have to worry about Dan not playing good music. Oh, he did play good music, and uh, that's, uh, that's always nice to have. Thursday, our social ministry team will meet at 6.30. They work on uh, being those people, those godly go-betweens that bring the love of Christ to people outside our doors. I think their point of emphasis these days is going to be our denomination's Good Gifts program. If you don't know about that, I'll tell you that I don't know for how many years that's been my Christmas gift and my uh, birthday gift, uh, one of the ELCA good gifts. uh, Gifts, basically what happens is you uh, send a donation to the ELCA, and for $20, you buy 20 chickens. Oh, for somebody in uh, in Africa uh, or somewhere else. Oh, so they'll be emphasizing that. And then the following Tuesday, uh, our council will meet and we'll be electing new council officers. I noted that uh, in preparation for the annual meeting, our current president, Sean Horn, said, well, next year, I want to do this. Oh, so I said, okay, (laughs) we got that one uh, handled. But uh, there are uh, a couple other slots Uh, we will have to fill, most notably the the slot of the biggest kid in the congregation, uh, Ray Lieberknight, who uh, will soon be writing his last set of minutes. Oh, he'll have to write minutes if he hasn't done it already for last night's uh, annual meeting, and then he'll he'll be done. Uh, And then just one final thing, uh, simple thing you can do to promote uh, this congregation. You can go to Google, google google.com. You can type in Mount Calvary Lutheran Johnstown. 
It'll bring up, uh, you know, a little blip or whatever for us. And then you can write a review. Real simple. Google.com, Mount Calvary Lutheran Johnstown. It'll bring up and you'll see that there are currently 27 people who have rated our congregation. Six new ones this week. Uh, and you click on write a review and you write a review. And guess what? The more people that review us, the higher up on the internet search uh, thing we go. Simple, easy. And hopefully uh, we can uh, increase that number uh, by another six, another 10, another 18 this week. I think another 18 is possible. In fact, I think we have about 41, 42 people here just in person this morning. We can increase it by 35. Look, biggest churches in town, and we're one of them, oh, they don't have all that many reviews. This is an easy way uh, that we can promote our ministry. Amen? And we'll be showing you, by the way, if you're not a techie person, how you can do this all oh, in worship in coming weeks. That's it for my announcements. you have any to add or share?